Welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm Suzanne Harris, and my listeners always get the story behind every book. Joining me today is such an interesting gentleman. His name is Dr. David Pete, and he's here to talk about his book, Crisis Relief, From Chaos to Calm, A Teacher's Guide. Now, Dr. Pete is a psychologist and a social enterprise entrepreneur. He specializes in educational transformation and improving health throughout Canada, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, and the Middle East. And his book is amazing. Dr. Pete, welcome. Oh, thank you. It's good to be here and good to talk to you. It's my absolute pleasure. I'm so glad that you and I are going to bring a book that I think is so important to the attention of our listeners. Before we really get started talking about the book, I'm always curious about how books come into being. Tell me the story behind Crisis Relief. Well, I'm glad you asked the question because um, the book actually was jointly put together by myself and Peter White, another psychologist, a colleague. Uh, When we um, first began to work in the Yukon Territories in the Canadian Arctic, as psychologists, one portion of our job was responding to major crises as they happened in the schools and communities, um, usually things like fires or suicides or unfortunately, the sexual abuse of children. And sometimes uh, we would also work with federal psychologists. Um, It's interesting that you should ask that because I was talking to my wife just before this interview, and she reminded me of of what we would do in the Yukon. We'd be in bed and the news would come on. And when certain news reports came on, I know that I'd be getting on a plane and going to that community because our territory went from um, White Horse all the way up to Old Crow, um, which listeners can look up on the map there, which is one of the most northern communities in the world. So that was the first edition that we uh, called the Crisis Intervention Manual. But um, the one that you're talking, that we're talking together about crisis relief, is an updated and retitled version. Um, It integrates new experience and information after Peter and I worked in the Maldives after the tsunami. And then since then, based upon work in post-war Kuwait, in post-earthquake Haiti, in Liberia, Sri Lanka, and for the last about seven years in Afghanistan. So the content of the second edition was added to reformatted, reformatted for easier access and published basically for my company, which uh, was called Transformational Education Incorporated. Um, One of the main motivations for the book was that basically in all those environments, I noted very clearly that teachers and community workers are simply not prepared to deal with students who have experienced trauma. That's either at the individual level or the community level. Um, In those places I've talked about, um, I saw that firsthand. But I also was a professor at the University and Teacher Preparation Programs, and I found that outside of what I was teaching in our program, I knew of no other teacher preparation program that addressed the topic of how teachers deal with students who have or are experiencing trauma. So that was the motivation. It's a guide for principals, teachers, school employees who do not really know what they will do if their school one day should experience the unthinkable. That's a perfect phrase. As a former teacher, I have to tell you, when I started looking at the book and reading through the table of contents, I was out of the classroom before all of the the violent uh, incidents, the shootings, and all of those kinds of things started happening. The only incident that we had in our school, and I started thinking about this, you really took me back to my days in the classroom. I started thinking about this. We had a suicide, and I remember that it was not really 
it wasn't really addressed. When I looked at your table of contents, and I love the title of the first chapter because it says, step one, open the book and find the information you need. I thought, this is absolutely perfectly (laughs) straightforward. But I don't remember any real intervention that took place. We had two or three counselors on staff, and of course, they recommended that the kids go to the counselors. But I don't remember anything happening with the teachers. I don't remember any kind of in-service. I don't remember anything that was different. And your book is so comprehensive. I thought, wow, if only we'd had this book in place. It's just, it's phenomenal. Let's give our listeners an overview of what they'll find in the book. Well, I think the first thing is I appreciate your um, perspective because that actually is the perspective that I find with most teachers when they're faced with um, those kind of crises at the individual level. But that crisis at the individual level affects, of course, the whole class and in some cases the whole school, even if it's one person committing suicide. Um, So the book covers actually those specific kind of crises such as grief, Um, death, um, suicide, and then it moves from there to um, how do you respond to a community-based or school-based crises such as school shootings and um, earthquakes, um, water, floods, and so on. And I don't know if your listeners probably have heard on the news what's happening right now in Canada uh, with the floods and with covid Um, I don't think there's ever been a time where teachers need this information as badly as they do now. Um, I just read one paper that talked about key findings from, um, it was from Alberta, uh, where they surveyed about 2,800 teachers, and half of them felt hopeless, and 65% of them were extremely concerned about their own mental health, let alone the mental health of the students. So the specific information, first of all, you need to know what a crisis is. What should immediate responses be? Now, I think one unique thing is um, teachers probably know, it's very, very practical. Teachers probably know that it's good to talk about a crisis with their students, but how do they do that? So it gives very comprehensive information about what exactly would you do when you're talking to your students. You set the ground rules. You circulate and ask individuals about what they saw and how they became aware of the incident. Um, You discuss needs with them. You gauge their reaction. You keep focused. I think one thing that's really important is that there are developmental factors that take place. You treat kindergarten students differently after a crisis than early elementary school students than high school students. So what do you do? What do the counselors do? What are their roles? What are the roles of teachers? What is the role of a secretary? What do school psychologists do? What do support staff do? And if it's something like a school shooting, how does a principal, who's the key person in a school, deal with the media? When there's a crisis, what do teachers do in terms of identifying what students have been greatly affected? What are cognitive signs, thinking signs? What things are physical? What are physical signs, emotional behavior, and so on? Um, You mentioned the suicide. Uh, What should have happened should have been some of those things that are suggested in the book. But also a memorial service. Is it appropriate to have one? How do you arrange a memorial service when there's a death? Um, All those kind of very, very practical things are what are in the book because it's written really for teachers and for educators who are on the front lines. Um, It's based on good theory and practice, but it's very much this is what you do. In fact, (laughs) it was kind of funny. Um, Our um, graphic designer he came up with a puzzle piece, and the puzzle piece just says what to do, and then the chapters are divided into very specific things to do in specific situations. So it's more of a manual or resource that can be used for planning, because that's really important that schools plan in advance in case a crisis happens, either at the individual or school or community level, 
but um, it's also important that then once that planning takes place, they have the resource available. Um, computers are great. Um, you can find almost anything you can possibly imagine, of course, on the web. But what do you do when there's a crisis? You need a resource that you can draw on immediately because one of the things that happens is that memory disappears. When you're in the midst of a crisis, your memory disappears. And how do you remember what to do? Um, so there's all sorts of forms and basically templates that you can follow that will tweak your memory if you've prepared in advance for a crisis. So I hope that answers the question. I think the word is, it is comprehensive. Um, it maybe should have been two or three books, but um, the thought was you need a comprehensive manual here, and that's what it was uh, designed for. A couple of things jumped out at me, that, and I thought, of course this should be in here, but I wouldn't have thought of it. You talk about self-care, and I thought, duh, of course you should think about self-care because talk about stress level, not only for the teacher, but the students and everyone else who's involved in the situation. And yourself is usually the last person that you think about taking care of in a crisis. Am I right? Uh, oh, you're absolutely right, yes. Um, in fact, there are, um, there are guidelines for self-care and also what a teacher, what an educator should do and not do. Um, in order to to engage in self care, the interesting thing is, especially the um, the suggestions at the high school level, they can probably be equally applied to the teachers because high school students respond largely as adults as they get older. So um, you're absolutely correct there. Um, and right now, with what's going on in the world, and I mean, I'm talking of Canada with the world with COVID, Canada with flooding that's uh, affecting large swaths of British Columbia, self-care of, of the people who are working um, at the front lines is really important as well. This would also apply. I'm in the U.S., and so I'm thinking about on the West Coast, California has almost has continuous fires. And so their, yes. their frontline fire workers, not only will they be physically exhausted and mentally exhausted, but this is trauma. And they're looking at things I'm sure you and I would not even want to think about seeing. I mean, there are animals that they see dead every day. There are people's homes and pets, and they're dead because of these fires. And that has to affect them. I thought about the floods as well that we've experienced here in the U.S. I live in Texas. We have tornadoes. The, way, the East Coast has hurricanes. So does the West Coast occasionally. I mean, there are so many things that happen that a book like this for even an individual to have at home if a crisis like a tornado or a hurricane happened to them, then they would have a resource for dealing with that traumatic situation. Um, yeah, I would agree. And also parents with their children. Um, I can tell you a quick story. Um, when I was teaching at university, one of my students actually had been through um, his community burnt down. It was called Fort McMurray in northern Alberta. And he had never dealt with the trauma. And uh, when when I was doing the unit on um, crisis intervention for teachers and students, he basically took that personally and worked through it and then did a presentation about it to the other students and what he did to deal with his own trauma, which he began to recognize reading the uh, book. Um, so that's one one application for certain, yes. I love this. There's an that you you oh, talked about Sorry. the you talked about the multicultural aspect and one thing that struck me was the healing circles that native americans have used tell me a little bit about that i really don't know anything about healing circles and when i saw that i thought i've got to ask about this because it sounds so interesting well the healing circles that I've experienced were in the far corners of the Arctic. And basically what it amounts to is people sit in a circle, which 
talks about equality and sharing. Um, it's a very traditional way of uh, sharing information. And it's basically working through um, each person talking about when they were first aware of the crisis, how they experience, what emotions they experience, um, what did they do to cope with those emotions, and so on. It's a flowing conversation, much like what we're doing right now. But what's different about it is that, um, well, in some cases, they pass a, um, I guess you call it a stick or a, a pipe or something that indicates this is a speaker. They listen respectfully to each other. In fact, I had what I would call a quite a negative experience, and it gives the idea of the power of some of these healing circles. I had to catch a plane. Um, because in some of these communities, they only leave at certain times. And if you miss it, you're stuck. <laughs> um, our, That's our stressful in itself. Quite over. <laughs> That's right. It was very stressful. But the healing circle wasn't quite over because I thought it would take maybe an hour. They were sharing and sharing deeply. And for me to leave then was a dreadful thing. So that's one thing about a healing circle. You have to let it peter out. When people have nothing else to talk about, that's when you end it. So that's one thing I learned from that experience. But that's a very respectful way to work uh, with some of the First Nations, or uh, we call them First Nation communities in Canada through a healing circle. Um I liked the the story that you shared about your student. Did he recognize that by doing what he was doing, he was really contributing to his healing? Uh, yes, that's what that's the point I was trying to get across. Exactly. Yes. Um. In fact, um, I can flip to the Maldives um, post um, tsunami. Uh, we went in there, and um, actually, at that point in time, there were no NGOs in, in Maldives. And this was the first disaster in their entire history. It's paradise until that point. Oh. So they didn't even have words for things like psychosocial support. Um, they didn't have vocabulary for it, so we had to move to visuals for um, what exactly are these people coming to my village for? Why do they need psychosocial support? But... Uh, it made the point, too, that often people's anxiety after a crisis, their stress is elevated because they don't know what are normal reactions to crises. So the thought is, is that what your experience is a normal reaction to abnormal events. And just that information about this is the way that the human beings respond to grief, to crises, lowers their stress level because they know, oh, I'm not crazy. In Kuwait, people thought they were crazy when they um, post-war Kuwait because they were not able to concentrate. They weren't able to focus. They were breaking down into, you know, crying for no apparent reason. But when they learn that this is a normal response to an abnormal event, as in the abduction of your children, then... Um, that alone was important. So it's the same in Canada and the developed world. Teachers need to know that this is normal responses of their children to crises, and there are things they can do and things they shouldn't do. Um, for example, a lot of teachers are excellent at behavior modification, behavioral interventions. In other words, they turn the screws or they, um, when someone isn't concentrating or uses reward systems and so on, well, after crises, that's the worst thing you can do. So they need to know what to do and what not to do. You know, the phrase that you just used, I think, is one of the most important phrases that you've said. Normal reactions to an abnormal situation. We're all experiencing that right now with COVID. And so our reactions that we feel like I may be a little, and I'm using air quotes here, nuts, if you'll pardon the use of that expression. <laughs> I'm really not. No, that's a good. <laughs> I'm really not a good nuts. good non-clinical expression. <laughs> Thank you. That's right, exactly. <laughs> but I think that's a really, really important point to make because you're right. We will 
react to a situation. And we can't think we're crazy. You're just reacting to something that is either out of your frame of reference or to something that's so difficult for you to handle that it feels it just feels wrong. Everything about it feels wrong. Does that make any sense at all? That, 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 oh, yeah, that definitely makes sense. I mean, a, a classic case would be um, death of a spouse or death of a family member, oh, particularly perfect. a spouse, and you're, you're left alone. Don't make any decisions. Uh, people make bad decisions there because they don't have concentration. They can't think clearly. They may be in a state of shock and so on. Um, so these things are important for people to know. Um, grief is a, a really important one. That I mean, take teachers, for example. Most know that there is a grief po- process that has stages, but they don't understand how grief is manifest in different age groups. They don't know what the normal grief process is versus one that requires intervention. So the fact that there are developmental differences between the way girls and boys respond at different ages, all that information teachers need to know so that they don't think that these are abnormal responses, but they're normal responses in abnormal situations. You and I could just talk and talk and talk. First of all, you are fascinating. And secondly, the topic is almost endless. I know that we have piqued the interest of our listeners. Let's let them know where they can find the book. Now, the book is available on Amazon. If you've never been to Amazon, just put Amazon in your search feature. Sometimes you don't even have to click. It just takes you there automatically. And (laughs) it's true, isn't it? (laughs) It is, yes, that's right. You'll see a, a big search box that's sort of a beige kind of a beigey gray trying a long square put the title of the book and that's in that rectangle the title of the book is crisis relief and then there's a colon from chaos c h a o s to calm a teacher's guide by dr d r period david W period, Pete, P-E-A-T. If you put that in the search feature and click on it, the book comes right up. Now, in the upper right-hand corner of the book, the representation of the cover, you'll see two words. It'll say, look inside. And if you've never done one of those look insides, just put your cursor on those two words and click it. The book will electronically open. You'll be able to see the table of contents. You will be astonished at the table of contents, how how informational it is and how it really tells you how complete and comprehensive this book is. I think Dr. Pete and and your co collaborator Peter White have thought of everything. I mean it's it's so comprehensive. Now after they've looked at the the book, after they've seen the look inside, they see the table of contents, there's a preface, you can read some of the information. You can also buy it right there on that page at Amazon. Now I know that some of our listeners prefer to buy their books elsewhere. Amazon, let's face it, is the 800-pound gorilla in the book market. (laughs) Is there another place, Dr. Pete, that they can find the book? Sure. Um, It's also quite simple. It may be simpler than Amazon, but it certainly (laughs) has not the power of Amazon, that's for sure. (laughs) Um, Just drpete.com. Um, D-R-P-E-A-T dot C-O-M. That will take you to my website, and in the website, you'll find that the book um, is mentioned. Clicking on the book will take you to the publisher that way as well. Tell me what else I'll find on your website. I believe there's also a blog. Um, I have a few blogs on the website. Um, I guess it's I'm in the phase where I've been in education for a long time. I think back, actually, I was very young. I started in the 1970s 
But I've learned an awful lot, and what my goal is to transfer some of that information to new educators just entering the field. So um, there's information there about a crisis intervention, obviously. But another area is um, building community with technology because technology sometimes is looked as imper- looked at as impersonal. Well, there are methods that you can use and apps and so on, teaching methodologies you can use that actually builds community. And what is envisioned is more and more information that is absolutely practical for teachers because I am a psychologist, educational psychologist, and I've worked with children and adults with almost every difference that you can imagine. But what I found is over time, a lot of that information for new teachers and for educators is simply not available, valid, reliable, good, tested information. So that's the kind of information that is envisioned in the future on my website that's just being built now, but there are some there. There is some information there right now. Now, this is going to be the one that has the Thrive Masters on it, right? Uh, Yes, it will. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Now, you're also on LinkedIn. How could our listeners find you on LinkedIn? Now, that's even easier. Just put in my name, David Peat. That's P-E-A-T, like as in Pete Moss. (laughs) <laughs> and make sure that it's the David Pete that um, is a, a curriculum developer, curriculum advisor, international consultant, that David Pete. And um, all the information is there as well. So just David Pete. That will find me on LinkedIn. Easy enough. Now I have one more question. You and I have talked at great length about this wonderful comprehensive book that you have done. When our listeners become readers and become book owners of Crisis Relief and they take it home, this is not a book that they'll probably read cover to cover. This is a book that they may start with the very beginning, with chapter one, that says, here's what you need and here's where to find it but they probably will go through the book, build their crisis team, and then as they need pieces, they will go through. But what do you, as the author and compiler of all of this amazing information, what do you really want the person who purchases your book to really know? What do you want them to take away? Well, it's not only what they know, it's how they feel. As in, I would like them to have the information that will equip them to be able to deal with the crises that they are invariably going to face in their classroom, either with an individual student or with a community crisis. I want their anxiety to be reduced, that they will know what to do should that happen. The main point I think from the book is once you know what should happen then there's motivation for not just individual planning for a crisis but school based planning and full school division planning and community planning because being prepared is really important because unfortunately we're living in a world either because of climate change, because of shootings, because of floods, because of fires. The vast majority now, particularly with COVID, of teachers are dealing with either themselves or students who have experienced some level of trauma. So the hope is that this is a book that equips and empowers teachers and others to know how to deal with these situations and know that they aren't alone, that the, that what they experience when they're going through a trauma is normal, as what you mentioned is key, normal responses to abnormal situations. So I think that's probably a summary of what is motivating, um, well, what motivated the writing of the book. You know, I think it's also important that you and I talked about other ways that the book would be valuable to an individual, the death of a spouse, the death of a parent. Um, the, The ideas in the book are geared specifically for the educational arena, but the information 
is applicable in so many other areas of our life. I can't tell you how much I have enjoyed having you as a guest on Books on Air. It has just been such a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for being with me today. Well, thank you for the opportunity. This is uh, not a normal task for me, so I really appreciate being able to talk to you, and thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Now, remember, you can find Dr. David Peet's book, Crisis Relief, From Chaos to Calm, A Teacher's Guide, on Amazon, or go to his website, and it'll take you straight to the publisher. You've been listening to the Books on Air podcast brought to you on webtalkradio.net. You can also hear this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. I'm Suzanne Harris, and I hope you'll join me for the next Books on Air podcast, because remember, you never know who's going to be here, and you never know what we're going to talk about. Thank you so much for listening.